out. Flight final. Go final. Both computer cycling. Data looks good. Roger. DC support. Right, sports. Range is forecasting all clear for launch. All right, Roger. Thank you. Four. Yo. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Ignition. Three. Heroes and Legends is really ultimately an attraction celebrating the human spirit in the early space missions, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Coming up with the, the, the who's your hero and you know what is a hero, uh, that theme kind of resonated in, in all of us because these people were just that, they were people. We really wanted to reflect that and have the audience start asking that question you know, to themselves, you know, wh who's a hero to me? When guests first come into the uh, Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, this is going to be the first thing that they see. They see this massive, sweeping building. It's beautiful, retro-futuristic, and they're going to see this welcoming ramp that's going to swoop through the rocket garden and into the second floor. You actually start on the second floor and pick up your 3D glasses. So once you get up to the top of the ramp, you enter the first theater. The first theater is called What is a Hero? We really wanted to make sure that all heroes were represented. We actually did a lot of diagrams to kind of represent that before we even got started with the editorial about how we wanted to communicate the different layers of hero and how it became personal and how it became kind of society's heroes. And certainly the astronauts that we are honoring in this attraction were on the side of society's heroes and American heroes, but ultimately they were also world heroes. So the second theater is called Through the Eyes of a Hero. It's really a giant compound curve theater screen that wraps 220 degrees around the guests who stand out on a floating platform in the middle of this massive room. Not only is it an incredible media screen, there's also an amazing sound system in there. Uh, there's wind effects, there's smells, there's lighting effects, and when all these things are combined, they really add to a exponentially better experience than if there was one or the other. The way the post-production works is uh, we start by creating the different assets in 3D, uh, all the environments and all the different pieces from props to vehicles that is used not only to tell the story, but also to enhance the VFX and the live action shoots. One of the most creative and challenging moments for animators on this project was dealing with the shape of the screen and the lenses that we used to be able to tell the story on that screen. Because of the, the large scale of these environments, we had to develop a uh, dual stereo rig for the camera, which would allow us to render part of the environment closest to us at a certain eye separation, and then the farthest area way back in the distance at an even further eye separation. One of the challenges we faced was how do we convey the message of going inside a memory for each one of the astronauts. So, uh, we took a little bit of a more literal approach to it and wanted to make it feel organic. So we actually looked at reference for how the brain works and we decided to go with a little bit of a fantastical approach towards that by going inside the eye and traveling in through the brain into individual memories, eventually revealing each one of the shots for the beginning of the sequence. The Mercury capsule, to work with that, you really get a sense of how small these spaces were. Trying to get a digital cinema camera into these spaces to get some POV shots was a, certainly a challenge. And even getting lighting and, and camera work done in those spaces uh, really didn't lend itself to a fisheye lens. We couldn't get the lens to undistort properly, so there was a lot of uh, by hand undistortion we had to do and program uh, basically a lens that would render it inside CG so that we could cut down on our render time. And we used a GPU renderer, Redshift, to render the whole thing and iterate over and over again. So one of the things that we tried to take into account for the Gemini sequence was the venue itself and how we can convey a message to the audience to feel like they were in space and to feel that uncertainty when things weren't going the way they expected. What we had to do is we had to create a realistic Earth and realistic capsules and intercut those with, uh, with scenes of, of actors inside a mock capsule. and. Make it all look photo real and like you were there. So the uh, third sequence we worked on was uh, John Glenn, 
uh, which was a reenactment of one of his dogfights during the Korean War. We did a lot of research and we tried to find a place on Earth that simulated as close as possible to where this actually took place. We had to generate a forest and landscape and trees and bushes. We ended up creating technology to spawn an instance of trillions of polygons. I think we ended up being about six and a half trillion polygons of instance geometry. We used a lot of NASA footage that came from their archives that they were gracious enough to let Falcon's Treehouse use in order to make sure that spaceships were animated in the proper way. With that, it creates an immersive environment, VR without glasses, where you're experiencing these stories really through their head. And the idea is that you are there in that moment. My most memorable moment in, in creating Heroes and Legends and being a part of that experience was working along with the team that restored the Mercury Redstone rocket, the, uh, the MR6, that you know, is suspended above the, the Act 3. And it had been badly damaged in a hurricane, and they were restoring it, but they pulled out all of the interior components, the, the brain that made this, this thing function. And just seeing you know, handwritten notes and, you know, pencil or, you know, little, little dabs of paint everywhere just made it such a human quality that people had to come up with these ideas and make these, these rockets and all of the technology work together. Heroes and Legends is different because it's, it's things that actually happened and, and trying to recreate it very accurately is, uh, is really you know, a challenge and it's fun. You just learn a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of the other projects we work on are, are fantasy and fiction, and that's what makes this unique. It's not just, it's not a museum. It's, it's really cool sounding and visually stunning effects. And, and it's just putting people in to what really happened is, is a very cool thing. The sound design in this project was actually very challenging. The uh, acoustics are, um, very challenging to work with because of the parabolic effect and all kinds of issues that we were running into. Also just coming up with the sounds that would make it just come to life was, was a challenge because of like we don't know what these things really sounded like <laughs> you know especially in space but uh, you know we, we take creative license too of course. The musical score was fantastic. Pinka was so awesome to work with, and just the skill set that she has, and, and the feel and the emotion that she's able to bring in the music was just a pleasure to work with. I have worked as a professional composer for 26 years, and in Hollywood for 17 years, and in video games for eight years, and that's a long time. And for me to be able to work on a project that is a dream of a lifetime, astronauts, American heroes, is an experience that I will cherish forever. And I have to mention, I'm, I'm a Bulgarian woman, and for me to be able to work on such profoundly heroic and um, amazing experience is something I'll be grateful for forever. It was a very emotional experience. I felt happy and elated and inspired. And uh, in a sense, this is the culmination of my professional career to date. The Mercury Mission Control Center there uh, at the exhibit is really something uh, to, to appreciate and to kind of soak in. It's amazing to see all the technology that was available at the time. I mean, stories are that some of that technology uh, may have been even a little bit staged just to upset the Russians at that time. But seeing all that technology there and what they were using to get these men into space, it's really, really remarkable. It's almost like you're there and you're seeing the ghosts of these men talking. So the hologram for the Gemini 9 experience is something that's very, very unique. It's, it's a really good example of bringing an artifact to life. The capsule itself is the actual capsule that flew in space with Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford. One thing that we decided to do a little bit differently that I've never seen done in a Pepper's Ghost effect before, the astronaut that was floating outside of this capsule actually was casting his shadow onto the capsule. We used motion capture for the first part of it, which was quite interesting, and we actually had somebody acting, kind of levitating, that was on the end of a table through most of the mocap, 
and then in our 3D world we kind of rotated them upside down and it seemed to work pretty successfully uh, in my opinion. So then on top of that we had registration issues with the physical capsule and just trying to make it as good as we could with this kind of technique for making a hologram. The editorial team had quite the challenge in putting together the stories for all the pods that the guests all experienced. We spent a tremendous amount of time researching the stories of the astronauts, the chronological order of all the footage that we acquired from NASA, what it meant and when it happened, to make sure that everything was historically as accurate as it possibly could be. Uh, we had a really good time interviewing all the different astronauts and hearing all their collective stories and experiences, many of which I personally had never heard before. Our media team produced well over four hours of original content for uh, Act 1, Act 2, all the pods, which there was 36 independent mini documentaries made and a lot of the B-roll photographs, media and whatnot for the Astronaut Hall of Fame, as well as the stories for Gemini 9 and Mission Control. One of the interesting things that I had to do was photograph some of the artifacts from NASA's personal collection of space memorabilia. And this involved light painting and using a lot of long exposure techniques to really bring out the greatest quality and of detail in everything from Gus Grissom's spacesuit to all the original fighter pilot helmets. One of my most memorable experiences in Heroes and Legends, uh, it was probably standing in Buzz Aldrin's living room, uh, fixing his tie and getting him ready for the interview that we were about to film. Uh, I had always been really uh, in awe of his accomplishments and uh, to stand with him took all those dreams I had as a kid of the kind of person that I would like to grow up to be and uh, brought it full circle. I think the updates for the, for the Astronaut Hall of Fame project a, a more high-tech feeling, you know, with the 360-degree projection cylinder. It was a great way to engage everybody to be able to find out more information and not just see, you know, a face and a name on the wall, as well as just the ambiance of all of the glowing, you know, the currently 93 glowing faces and, you know, all of their mission badges just envelop everybody once you enter the space. It really becomes a magical experience. The kiosks that are around the Astronaut Hall of Fame cylinder, which is that moving image that kind of cascades up into the ceiling, it has a huge database of all the astronauts in the Astronaut Hall of Fame, including all of their missions, and it'll even hot link you to all the other crew members on each mission. It tells their biography, has photographs of all their various accomplishments in chronological order. It also has several movies when available of, of different moments in their professional career. I think ultimately what people will remember about this attraction is that, you know, astronauts are humans just like you and me, and uh, we're hoping really to inspire the next generation of young people to become astronauts, to see that this is an attainable goal, to see that this is something that they could ultimately do in their life if they work hard and they follow the right path. Um, and certainly if they set that goal, it's definitely achievable, and these guys are living proof. I hope people take away from the Heroes and Legends project inspiration for future astronauts and risk takers. I hope people walk away with wanting to, wanting the space program to just advance again. John F. Kennedy got that inspiration going back in the 60s. And I think going through this exhibit and seeing these things and hearing these things might spark that interest again, you know, for, for our younger people to go, I need to do that. I hope this facility really inspires the next generation of astronauts. I, I really hope that maybe someday the first person who is going to walk on Mars started their journey perhaps in the halls of Heroes of Legends. I think this experience will inspire people to become better human beings and to follow their dreams. 
and I can say I'm someone who followed my dreams and um, it's a special, beautiful gift in life to be able to live your dream. Godspeed, John Glenn.